Hello, my dudes. Welcome back to Previously Gifted. I hope you've been having a good week so far, and I hope that this episode makes your day a little bit better. Uh, today, I just wanted to answer some questions. Uh, so on Instagram, I asked you guys if there were any particular topics you would like me to cover, um, because my recent life has only involved um, watching <laughs> watching videos about the upcoming primary, which political warning, I will talk about it at the end of the video, so don't be scared of any politics too early on. Um, but yeah, I've been watching mm, a mind-numbing amount of political content. And then, um, what else? Seen a couple movies, kind of the usual shit, you know? There's not, there's not a crazy amount of things going on. So I just wanted to chat about topics. So that's what we're gonna do today. Uh, so first of all, let's give a shout out to our patrons. As always, if you guys wanna support the podcast with a small financial donation monthly, you can go to patreon.com slash previously gifted. We do have a new patron today, and her name is Amy Holiday with two L's. But she's, she's, she's on vacation all the time, apparently. Um, Amy, thank you so much for becoming a patron. Thank you for supporting the podcast. And now we will give us sponsors to our shout out. And I said that intentionally, 100%. And also, we're going to give a shout out to our sponsors. So we have Hannah Baker, Sam Orn, Eric Courtright, and Liz Walsh. Thank you guys so much for being sponsors. Um, today's setup... Uh, we're back on the couch. I'm just trying, like, I'm feeling around in this apartment, trying to figure out, like, the best lighting, the most comfortable space. I have found that sitting on this couch, for those of you watching on YouTube, um, it's comfortable. Have you ever sat on a couch before? It, it's kind of nice. I would recommend it. Um, kind of weird that, like, it's a comfortable place to sit. You wouldn't really expect that from a couch. Anyway, the lighting is not the best, but... Uh, what can you do? Most of all, my outfit. You can't even see the full extent of it. I just started a couple loads of laundry because I'm going to be productive as hell while I'm recording this. Um, I'm wearing my elephant pants, this uh, t-shirt I was given for free, this very warm but too warm for the setting sweater, and um, I threw on, of course, some tennis shoes. So I'm wearing a good fit, and that's what matters because the podcast is in an audio medium. What, what do you call that? There's a word for it, like visual, but for audio. I'm an idiot. I don't know. I don't have a vocabulary yet. Let's jump in with a question. Um, first question was to talk about diversity in movies. So tired of the white heterosexual dude-centered stories and why it is important to hear or watch movies about other types of people, such as non-white and LGBT experiences? Great question. Um, very relevant to the uh, Academy Awards. Actually, I didn't watch them, of course. I actually was at a comedy show with my friend Locha the other night, my Dutch friend from camp. Um, so yeah, we were, we were just watching some comics instead of um, the awards. I never really watch award shows. But anyway, um, I think the Academy Awards were definitely more diverse this year. I mean, I don't know. It's always a question of like, <laughs> like, oh, if you get one movie that has a black supporting actor, is that diversity? Like, I don't know what our current standards are. So it's like, on one hand, I want to praise certain movies for what they've done. But it's like, is it ever enough? Not yet. We're always moving forward, always asking for more. But anyway, um, I think I was watching, it may have been Connie Glynn's channel or somebody completely different. Maybe I started with Connie Glynn and then ended up somewhere else. But I was watching this video that was basically about, yeah, I think it was Connie Glynn. Anyway, <laughs> um, it was about queer baiting and queer catching, I think. There's a whole realm of like, you know, what, what TV and movie producers do in terms of like, taking advantage of the ships that that form in the audiences of their shows so like oh you ship i oh god i can't think of anyone <laughs> you ship rachel and monica why would i use a friends reference when i don't even watch friends um but yeah like they'll take advantage of a ship that exists wow you can really hear the city sounds i love when the sirens come through while i'm recording my podcast also how first world of me to be like <laughs> I hate when someone's having an emergency and I'm recording a podcast. Anyway, they take advantage of the ships 
Um, but nothing substantial comes out of it. So it's like they're just taking advantage of the hopes and dreams of their viewers because their viewers want to see some diversity. They want to see some LGBT, LGBTQ representation. Um, but anyway, that video was really interesting. But it got me thinking because I realized that I have never considered the fact that if I were gay in any way, like how my movie and TV watching experiences would be so different. I don't know why I've never really thought about it from like that direct perspective. But like when we're talking about the diversity of characters or including lesbian characters or gay characters or LGBTQ, whatever, any type under that umbrella. Um, yeah, I feel like it's just like, oh, good. We got a gay character. We have a lesbian character. Um, but it's not just about that. It's like the type of romantic storylines that they have. I was reading the comment sections. I have a really bad habit of like, while I'm watching and binging YouTube content or something, I will be scrolling through the comments at the same time. So it's like, am I really even watching or listening to the video? I don't know. I feel like I learn more from the comment section. Um, <laughs> but so I'm reading the comment section and, and people are talking about how like, there's often like a tragedy that happens to the like one gay character. It's like, oh, the lesbian falls in love, but then she dies tragically. And it's like, why? Why does that have to happen? Um, but also, yeah, like, I don't know. Like in a movie, you may see like a, a gay kind of relationship, but then it's just not like it's not expressed the same way as like a regular heterosexual relationship would be. Like somebody was talking about, I don't know if it was them referring to Frozen 2 or something, but basically saying that it's considered perverse to include a gay relationship or a, or a, a lesbian relationship, whatever it be, um, in a children's movie because gayness is perverse. They're like, it's not perverse to put like, a, a, a girl having a crush on a boy or vice versa in a children's movie happens all the time but suddenly if if anybody there is gay in some way or bi or anything it's like uh oh this is uh getting a little weird but it's like <laughs> what is that what is that any kind of a gay relationship have to have to have that um like sexual undertone like if it's between kids it's just as innocent and also sexuality isn't like not innocent but you know like it's a crush or whatever like it doesn't mean that any kind of gay relationship or expression of gayness or curiosity or what whatever um that that is like an inherently sexual thing it's just oh anyway as you can tell I, i'm not very good at um talking about this out loud because you know, something I've realized recently about myself is like, I need more variety in my life. Um, I feel like I don't have many like friends in general right now, like in my in-person life. I, I interact with people online and I keep in touch with people back home. But like when it comes to the people that I am around and surround myself with and like that exposure that you get to different people, I'm just not getting that, you know? Like, again, I've been hanging out with Nathan for a long time, but that's not a lot of diversity in my relationship. It's good to be around different groups of people um, just to get different perspectives. And I feel like I'm really lacking that. But then I'm like, how do I join um, diverse friend groups, you know? Or like, how can I, I mean, I don't know. Not that I would want to make friends for the purpose of having a diverse friend group because that sounds like bullshit. Um, but like, you know, I don't know. I think about it and I'm like, I need to be friends that have, or like I need friends that have experiences and lives that are different to mine so that I can learn from them and understand them more because it's so hard to, again, like I can watch videos. I can watch videos about people's lives and experiences being gay or being black or being Asian or anything, but like, it's not the same as being friends with them and really getting to discuss things and maybe ask questions or like, and again, the point of the friendship or the relationship wouldn't just be to sit there and quiz them about what their life is like. Um, but you know, like just the things that you learn from a nice real friendship with someone, you learn a lot about their upbringing and what their life is like in general. Anyway, um, <laughs> 
<laughs> I hope that this is coming across the way that I mean it. But basically, like, yeah, I feel like that's something that's lacking. It's like I don't get to have conversations like this with people. I have it maybe online or I watch someone discuss things, but it's so important to have those like two way, like actual conversations about these issues because that's how you learn to discuss things and how to phrase things. And you learn about what all of these very complicated ideas are, such as queer baiting or queer catching. I hope that's what it's called. Anyway, if you want, you should look up that video because it's it was very interesting to me. Um, I feel like I went off the rails of that question. But anyway, my whole point was, holy shit, I'm straight. And my whole life, I've obviously seen more straight characters and relationships than I could ever need. But like, any time I watch a movie, there's no lack of being able to see those relationships. And I, I just think about like my, my personal love of romantic comedies and how like if I want to feel some type of way, if I want to imagine what it's like to be in love with Bradley Cooper or Matthew McConaughey or anybody, um, I just have to turn on a, a romantic comedy. And it dawned on me, so obviously, that like anyone who is LGBTQ plus does not have that same luxury of just turning on Netflix, choosing any rom-com and, and having it fit their life. Like they're not allowed to, or not allowed, but like they can't put themselves in that situation, which is a big part of why people enjoy watching movies is like, you know, living in that reality for a bit. Um, yeah, it just dawned on me that like, <laughs> That's why representation, among so many different things, but one reason why representation of LGBTQ relationships is so important because they just don't, they don't get to see a diverse uh, representation of those relationships. I mean, just as with like any kind of straight character or straight relationship, we have now seen the entire possible spectrum of like a super healthy, ideal, wonderful relationship and like a troubled, horrible, unhealthy relationship and everything in between. But we don't see that or we haven't had the chance to see enough of those different relationships in terms of the LGBTQ context. So anyway, yeah, I finally, finally put myself in somebody else's shoes and uh, realized, oh, but anyway, yeah, there is so much more to, you know, the need for diversity in film and TV, even like irrelevant to that. But that's just one part of why we need it. Anyway, you're totally right. We need more diversity, dude. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> it is pretty fucking crazy. Like how many of the exact same stories that we see, like, and that was just exploring the relationships, you know, that are between like the stars and whoever they're chasing. But like, just in general, like the perspective that, that we have seen so much of, which as you said, um, you're totally right, is just the white heterosexual dude, you know, like we've seen it. We've seen it literally millions of times. And there are so many other types of people in the world with completely different perspectives and experiences. And guess what? Those would be great plots to be able to explore, you know? <sighs> anyway, whew, that one got me going. Thank you for a good question. Um, <laughs> Next question is from my girl, Casey. She asked, have you ever talked about the expectations of college students when they graduate and the reality of that situation? Um, I may have discussed this a little, a little bit, but obviously as someone who has not yet graduated, I cannot even actually imagine what it is like to be in the position of someone who finally finishes your degree, whether it's your bachelor's or your master's or your PhD or anything else. Um, <laughs> but, you know, just from what I've seen, because again, I've had a couple of friends who have graduated so far and have either joined master's programs or um, have started their jobs or their job searches. But um, I know that Casey recently graduated, so that's why she's asking the question. By the way, Casey, I just want to give you a big shout out for graduating because everyone deserves like a sincere not thank you. A sincere congratulations because it is not easy to go through four years of college or even more. Um, it's not easy and I think everybody uh, should get a nice freaking strong pat on the back. Like, that, that was not nice. Um, I watched a... 
<laughs> Irrelevant. I watched um, Dave Chappelle's comedy special on Netflix last night. And, you know, comedians are always, like, banging on the microphone for, like, Foley sound effects. So they're like, doot, 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 like, on the mic. I thought I could do the same thing with the pat on the back. But this mic, uh, I'm scared to hit it any harder like that. So never mind. Um, but, yeah, in terms of the expectations for new grads, like, I mean, I can understand the stress of paying back student loans because I've already been in the process of doing that, even though I'm only halfway through my degree. I guess right now I, I could technically um, go into deference because I'm in school, I think, but I obviously want to continue making payments so that it doesn't just continue to grow and grow and grow uh, more than it already is, my balance, that is. Um, but yeah, there is a big expectation, obviously, like you went to college because you wanted to get a good career. And then suddenly it's the moment where you're actually supposed to start applying for real jobs, you know, ones that require a degree and have a salary and hopefully some kind of benefits. And I mean, I've only gone on like LinkedIn, but I've seen what some of my classmates are up to. And um, I've seen the hustle. I've seen, you know, what it's like to try to literally on LinkedIn. It's like you try to create this like super professional, you know, persona for yourself because you want to be taken seriously. But it's just so funny because it's like, here we are, you know, 21, 22, 23, however old you are. And you have a degree, but I'm expecting you probably don't feel like a real adult. A lot of people have this kind of like imposter feeling. Like you feel like, okay, I've clearly learned things since I graduated high school. Like I've spent the last four years or so like acquiring knowledge, but like, am I even that much more ready, like at all for the real world? Am I that much more prepared for an actual job? And I don't know. Um, so anyway, I'm just like making this up because again, I personally can't speak to it, but I would love to have um, some other people on this show, <laughs> the <this> show, <laughs> on the podcast, um, because I want to hear other people's perspectives and I want to have more conversations like this that actually involve someone who knows what the fuck they're talking about. So stay tuned for that. I don't know. All I can say is hang in there. Um, yes, pay your loans, you know, try to do a teeny bit more than minimum payments if you possibly can. Um, but I know that's only one element and I'm sure a lot of it is like ex existential stress and just having breakdowns over what the fuck you want to do, especially if you want to do something that's different or unrelated to what you got your degree in. It's just like, <laughs> what's the point? How do we do it? Is anybody sure? I don't know. <laughs> But anyway, uh, next question. Uh, someone asked for breakup advice. Actually, two people asked for breakup advice. So I will jump into that. Um, breakup advice. I just went through a breakup and someone else said how to deal with a breakup. Um, I have to dig into my, my memories, the depths of my soul, because I'm currently in a very happy relationship, which is great. But obviously, I've had my fair share of breakups. And, um, well, the first thing is <sighs> breakups totally suck, but they're different based on whether you were broken up with or if you did the breaking up mostly. Um, I think in my experience, it hurts a lot more to be broken up with, obviously, because I think that's when it comes kind of more out of the blue. You're not necessarily expecting it. Obviously, when you're the one breaking up with someone, you have that time to mentally prepare to do so, and you feel a lot more detached than the other person who kind of can get, like, you know, blindsided a bit. Um, literally, my stomach hurts just thinking about it. I'm like, fucking A. Heartbreak sucks, dude. Um, yeah, I... It's like there are so many stages to a breakup. Like I straight up have had like that very stereotypical, like sobbing every day, like wanting to scream and punch pillows, like breakup <laughs> reactions. Uh, and that fucking hurts, dude. And then there's like the can I win this person back stage? I mean, I don't know if you're you're feeling that, but like sometimes it's like especially when someone breaks up with you, you're like, oh, shit, like what did I do wrong? You kind of blame yourself or wonder like what you could do to change it to make them maybe want to be with you again. Um, and that's fucking hard because it's like, in reality, there's nothing that you can do. Like if someone makes the decision that they want to end a relationship, it's, it's pretty much done there. You know, there's very little 
uh, opportunities to be able to like fix that and actually get back into the relationship and truly, you know, be able to fix those issues. Um, cause yeah, sometimes, sometimes a breakup doesn't even have to have a reason, you know, it could just be like, I just wasn't feeling it anymore or I fell out of love. Sorry. Still like you as a person, but gotta move on. It's fucking brutal, dude. Um, and then I think there's like the long, long painful stage of trying to move on. And that's such a fucking messy time because it's like, um, one day you're like, I am an independent lady and I don't need anybody. I'm assuming most of us are ladies because my demographics are like 90% women. But uh, you could be an independent man as well. Or, you know, gender non-conforming, non-binary. I'm trying to be like as inclusive linguistically as I can in this podcast. So, hey. But anyway, um, yeah, like there are days where you feel really good about yourself And then the next day you feel like you got hit by a truck with grief in losing a relationship. Um, (laughs) That's fucking horrible. Anyway, my, my biggest breakup advice is that you truly need to distance yourself. So like, you know, the, the usual advice of like, deleting pictures or at least getting them out of your way because if it's right there at the top of your camera roll like every time you look at your phone you're going to be like tempted to look at pictures of you guys together and that's not good um but also I'm not a fan of like deleting them like you know I don't like to like completely delete someone from my memory my digital memory of somebody really matters um you know I may want to archive some pictures on Instagram so that it's not like still right there in your face um but you know, I, I feel kind of weird, like, at the concept of just, like, deleting everything that you've ever had with somebody. I don't know. I'm a sentimental ass bitch. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, t- try to remove them from your daily life so that you're not reminded of them more often than they're already popping into your head, I'm sure. And then, you know, the classic advice, like, you got to distract yourself. You've got to do something to get you out of the house. Don't stay alone crying all the time. Um, Try to hang out with your friends. Breakups are actually a great time to reconnect with your friends. Um, If you're like me and my friend group of ladies, like, uh, when, when you get into a relationship at least for me and a lot of my friends, like it can kind of suck you away from your friend group because yeah, you have less time, you're hanging out with your significant other most of the time probably. And you know, people tend to slack on their friend relationships during that time. So when you break up and you're single again, you're like, ladies, who wants to go to the club? Or like who wants to watch She's the Man and eat food, you know, (laughs) whatever you do. But um. I actually, I have like a, a group chat going with my, my girlies and every couple months we'll, we'll check back in with each other because we all live kind of all over the place and it'll just be like, hey ladies, miss you. Like what the hell are you guys up to in your lives? And um, I just said life's lives. Uh, sometimes people are like, well, I got dumped or I broke up with so-and-so. I'm single now, doing this, dating. What are you guys up to? Got a new job. Like... <laughs> It's very complicated, but it's good to check in with your friends. That's what I'm saying. Um, so use the the free time that you have as something positive. Don't think, oh, this person is, is gone and now I'm an empty black hole of misery um, because, you know, that's not true. I get it, though. It's horrible. And sometimes it takes literally years to get over someone fully. And there are still times where they'll pop into your head or you'll have a fucking dream about them. And you're like, excuse me, dreams? Like, that is so damn rude. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think it just it takes a lot of time to, to truly move on. And again, you don't have to expect yourself to move on quickly. But, like, there is, like, the initial, like, conscious stage of moving on. And then there's the subconscious, I believe. So, like, you can control the conscious stage in, like, actively trying to move on and then the actual healing will happen later um (laughs) fuck i just lost what i was gonna say it was something related to moving on and healing um i don't know oh yeah closure (sighs) this is a mess (laughs) so um closure i'm like thinking about all the times like all of my relationships over the years Um, I feel like you go through the, the breakup and that's a loud and messy, like, you know, you can fight or you can argue and you can cry together and then you don't talk for a long time. And then somehow you reconnect 
and I crave closure. Are you kidding me? <laughs> like, um, like my very first like real relationship. Years later, I was able to um, meet back up with the guy, and we just like hung out and like got lunch. And I was just like, so yeah, like remember that time you fucking broke my heart? <laughs> And I feel like I usually wouldn't be that type of person, but, like, that relationship did fuck me up. Like, you know, um, it it just took a long time for me to get over it. So when I was finally over it, I was like, okay, well, now can we talk about some things? Because I have some questions, you know? Like, do you realize what you did? Or, like, why didn't you text me back? Um, Still kind of getting back into that crazy kind of after breakup mindset. Um, But still, it was nice to be able to, like, see him and be like okay, I'm over you. I'm glad you're still kind of a dick in my head, but also I I will always care for you because that's what exes are for, you know? So that was one. And then uh, another one of my relationships, we broke up and it was pretty messy. And then again, same thing. We didn't talk for a while. And then again, met back up. Hey, you want to get coffee? And then we were chatting and having a really great time. Um, And I was like, damn, I am genuinely happy for you. Like, our breakup was good for you. It was good for both of us. Like, it allowed both of us to heal ourselves because we were both going through some shit. And, like, sometimes you do just need to be alone, which is tough. It's really hard to accept that sometimes it's good for a relationship to end or at least pause or I don't know. Um, I don't really believe in breaks because I think that breaks are just breakups, like when you don't want to be like upfront about it. (laughs) And, um, so I don't like when, when somebody, uh, is like, oh, well, let's go on a break. I need to see how I feel. It's like, just fucking break up with me. Okay. No, like we're not going on a break. And then like, I don't know, seeing other people and then getting back together, like, acting like nothing happened. I don't know. I personally don't think I'd be able to handle that. Some other people can. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it's it's interesting when you get to finally have that kind of closure, discuss what went wrong with like a lot less emotion than when it's still raw, like right after the breakup. I'm going to restart my camera because I think it's going to stop recording. All right, and we're back. Um, and I think my laundry is going to be ready in a minute. Yeah, it is. Great. Um, yeah, it's like you have to be able to, for me, I like to be able to have that closure and to be able to talk and ask just a couple questions. Because even in those like long, painful, drawn out breakups where you're like, you're going back and forth and you're you're talking so much but you never seem to get anywhere it's like you can hash everything out but really the true closure comes later when you get to have a a more open mind about it and just be honest i don't know at least that's my opinion um and then sometimes you don't get closure and that can be a real fucking again a mind fuck um (laughs) when you're like i have questions and you won't answer them or like we didn't have the chance to discuss something like what went wrong what if um i was listening to something recently though that was like um you don't need closure and sometimes closure isn't as good for you as you think it would be like closure this idea of closure that you have won't solve all your problems again like that closure that meeting or that chat isn't going to heal you. And I think sometimes we feel like, oh, if I just got closure, then I'd be able to move on and I'd be okay. But it's like, that's not necessarily true. Um, so that was kind of a, an interesting thing. It, that definitely made me think back to some of my past breakups and go, oh yeah, like, I, you know, I don't know. Again, it's not a science. <laughs> um, breakups are just fucking messy and they're horrible. And I, for those of you who are currently going through a breakup, I am seriously sorry. It fucking sucks. Like, you know, sometimes the end of a relationship can completely throw your fucking life upside down. And that's hard in every way. But also you are, you know, you have to adapt and learn to live life without somebody that you previously were very, very close to. Um, So I feel for you because that's not fun at all. But also you're a fucking awesome person and there's so much going for you. And take this opportunity to, again, I'm a big fan find a new hobby or reignite an old passion that you used to have, really work on yourself because now you've got the time to do it, baby. Um, All right, I'm going to go get my laundry, put it in the dryer, and then we'll be back for the next segment of the pod. Thank you guys for listening. 
Also, sorry, <laughs> I like paused and like posed because I was ready to cut it off. This lighting looks so bad right now. So if you're watching on YouTube, I apologize. If you're listening, I apologize. Okay, bye. And we're back after quite a long break. I usually start recording like right away, but I had to go get my laundry, fold my laundry. I was on the phone with my parents for 30 minutes. Hi mom, hi dad. Um, and oh yeah, then my, my heater came on and it's this loud hissing noise that makes it impossible to record or film anything. So that's great. Anyway, I'm back and we're gonna finish this episode, baby. Um, I have a review. I ask you guys often to leave a review for Previously Gifted on iTunes slash Apple Podcasts, and I have one new review to share with you. Five stars, love this podcast from Shaylin. I'm a fan of her YouTube videos, but her podcast is another ball game. I feel a lot closer when I listen to her podcasts and hear her perspective on the world and various topics that I may not think of myself. She is truly relatable and not in the surface level kind of way. Even if we don't agree on everything, I appreciate Tiffany's thoughtfulness on everything, plus her awesome TV show recommendations. Thank you so much for leaving that review. It's very sweet. Um, Once again, it helps the podcast if you guys leave reviews. It makes Previously Gifted look more legitimate, um, and it just fills me with joy. So thank you guys so much. Um, This part of the podcast, um, I almost forgot that I still do want to talk about the primaries, but that'll be at the very end of the episode, and I will give you a trigger warning (laughs) in terms of political content. Um, But I did get a couple more questions on my Instagram, so here we go. Actually, I got one, two, three, three Bernie 2020 or political (laughs) suggestions, so I will get to that. Um, Oh, somebody asked, what are the differences between Long Island and Queens? So in case you didn't know, um, I lived in Nassau County, which is just outside um, Queens County, but it's on Long Island and it's not considered part of New York City, or it's just not part of New York City. Um, But I was in a very residential and like suburban area. It's definitely a very um, family-friendly town. Like there were just like kids and families around and it definitely wasn't a place for young people. Um, So Nathan and I, you know, we'd drive to like the movies or whatever, but there was really nothing within walking distance and there was like you know just nothing going on it's not that type of a town so that's where we were last year and I really liked the apartment but um, I'm much much happier where we currently are we have our own one bedroom apartment which has been legendary I'm like every day I get to just be here by myself have I told you guys I don't know if I've mentioned this on the podcast I may have or maybe I didn't I wanted to tell you guys about this horrible habit I have of locking myself in my room. Um, I don't know if that stems from like my childhood and just wanting to feel like I had my own kind of space. Um, Because growing up, I always shared a room with my siblings, um, either my sister or my brother and my sister, which is like a big dorm room, which sounds fun. And then you get tired of it. But anyway, I think I've become the type of person who like, like even... (laughs) Every single time I like go in the bathroom, I close the door and lock it. Every time I walk in my house, I immediately close the door, lock it. Um, And yeah, I tend to spend a lot of time in my own bedroom. So in like a a shared space kind of situation, like um, our last apartment, we had roommates. So it was two bedrooms, it was us and then another couple in the other bedroom. And like during the day, me and... uh, the girl roommate, I don't want to say her name for some reason. I'm like, privacy. Um, Me and her would be home because we both worked from home and like we would like kind of avoid each other. Like I would be in my room and then I'd go out and make breakfast and come back in. And then when I was in my room and the door closed, I would hear her go out and then she'd be in the kitchen. And I don't know. I don't know. We never talked about this. It was like an unspoken thing. I think both of us just wanted to like not see anyone yet. So we're like, I'm just going to respect this and not go outside at the same time. Um, but anyway, <laughs> so I did that. And then uh, and then being in England with Nathan's family, his family is super friendly. Um, 
But, like, I'm not used to being around family. Like, even in my own house growing up, again, like, me and my family didn't necessarily, like, hang out in the living room together and, like, play card games. Um, So I haven't been used to, like, just chilling with the fam, usually. Or at least, like, you know, even regardless of whoever I'm around, I just want to go hang out in my room by myself a lot of the time. I'm a solitary girl. Um, So anyway... (laughs) In England, I felt really bad because I would always either be, we had like a separate kitchen. So I'd either be in that separate kitchen, like making my breakfast, completely chilling, completely content to be by myself. But Nathan's mom would be like, you know, you can come out and hang out with us. If you want to come into the, the main kitchen or watch this movie with us, you can come out. I'm like, I know I can. And thank you. I appreciate that. You're so sweet. But I'm like, I just love to be alone. So then I'd like scurry back upstairs and just go hang out in our room. So then when we got back to New York, we were staying with a friend um, and he has like a big house. So we had kind of like a whole wing of the house and um, they have a housekeeper who lives in the house. So (laughs) it would just be me and the housekeeper at home. And I would like come downstairs, make my breakfast. I feel like a, like a mouse running around the house, you know, like I try to be quiet, except you can always hear like the videos that I'm listening to or the podcasts. So other than that, I'm silent. You'll never see me, never hear me. So I'd like come downstairs, make my peanut butter toast, bring the food upstairs because again, I don't want to be caught in a common area and maybe have to have a conversation. Um, and then when Nathan would get home at like 5 p.m., She would go, oh, I didn't see Tiffany all day today. And he'd be like, yeah, she was here. And I'd be like, yeah, I just, I came downstairs like twice in eight hours of the day and that's it. So anyway, after that, it's like, even if you're in the most like nice and inviting kind of environment, I still just love to like be in my own space. And I think people can understand that. So it's been very significant for me to be living here Like every morning when I wake up, Nathan goes to work pretty early. Um, I wake up and I just get to chill. I get to like chill in whatever I'm wearing. I don't have to get ready at all. I can make my cup of tea. I can have my breakfast. I can hang out in the living room if I want. I can hang out in our room if I want. I can sit at our dining room table. Any space that I'm in is completely mine. And then when Nathan comes home, we just chill. And it's like, Wow, the life of like not having roommates for once. It's crazy. Anyway, wow, that was a long-winded explanation. Um, Other than the actual apartment, which I love, again, I'm so happy to be in Queens where we are. So the area of Queens that we're in is um, just perfect in terms of like subway connections to where like I need to go and it's easy for Nathan to get to work. So it's just perfect. But also... um, it's like there are actual things around like there are three starbucks's within walking distance like within like less than 10 minutes that's dangerous for me um even more so i haven't even been going to starbucks because i like to drink tea and freaking sparkling seltzer or whatever um but that's irrelevant so there's like a chipotle like there are all of our favorite restaurants (laughs) starbucks chipotle that's it um There are other restaurants to try, like Queens is just really cool, Um, and this area is very safe, it seems to be so far, and it's just the perfect balance of like a good amount of things within walking distance, but also not crazy busy, like, you know, Manhattan would be. To me, Manhattan would be like too much, and Brooklyn's really cool, but um, this part of Queens makes more sense, again, in terms of like where we're commuting to, so I'm a happy girl. Um, it's very weird to say like that I live in New York City now. Like I'm, uh, <laughs> I've made this joke before. I'm a New Yorker. Um, I'm a resident of the state and city of New York, but am I a New York, New Yorker? A you Yorker? New York, New York, New York, New York. Is that how it goes? Unique New York, unique New York. Hmm. Anyway, I-, I like it. That's your answer. Thanks. Um, Okay, now we'll give a little political warning, political warning. If you don't want to hear my political thoughts, you can leave. But also, I'm going to try to be nice and open this year, okay? If you've been around since 2016, you know what my position was. You know who I supported. Spoiler alert, it was Bernie. Um, Yeah, Bernie really did something for me. (laughs) And by that, I mean, like, 
he lit a damn fire in my heart and my soul, um, not just for politics, but for his type of politics. And I believe Bernie to be a very authentic politician, which is rare these days. Uh, Bernie is an OG progressive. Um, You can literally go back and watch his speeches from decades ago, like the beginning of his career in Congress. He has been fighting for the exact same like platform. He has been fighting for universal health care, affordable college, getting money out of politics, getting corrupt politicians out. Um, and he's just the real deal. So obviously, holy shit, when Bernie announced that he was finally running, um, oh my God, Nathan literally woke me up and he's like, here's some good news for you. And I was like, what? And then I was like, Bernie 2020. Oh my God. Um, yeah, he's just, he's a big inspiration to me. And I know that this election is a high stakes election. I like, I don't know. I think back to 2016 and, you know, everything that everyone thought and then what ended up, you know, happening, Trump. I think if you guys haven't seen Michael Moore's documentary, you should watch it. It's called Fahrenheit 11.9 and it is about um, Trump's presidency. It's very, very powerful. I love Michael Moore. Um, but the the opening scene of that is like the hype of Bernie or no, The opening scene was the hype of Hillary supporters and like the excitement around like the thought of having the first female president and everyone believed there's zero chance that Trump will win. Hillary's got it in the bag. And then it goes, but then something started to happen on election night when Trump started to gain momentum and gain, um, you know, votes in the electoral college. And then suddenly he won and everyone was devastated. And literally that's the beginning of the film. And it made me fucking cry. And I wasn't even like a fan of Hillary, um, but it made me cry. And it made me realize my, the change that I've had in my mindset since 2016. Um, Hillary was not a perfect candidate, but obviously she would have been a million times better than Trump. Um, But really, like when we're going into 2020, it's just a completely different time. Things have changed. A lot of things have changed since 2016. So immediately I saw some criticism of Bernie where people are like, go away, old man, like you're done. Like you've already been beaten. But I'm like, how could you say that? Like Bernie is the one who introduced almost all of the ideas in 2016 that people called pie in the sky, impossible, never going to happen. Those are the same issues that are at the front of the Democratic platform right now. And if you want to be a contender in the 2020 primary for the Democrats, you have to support universal health care and affordable college and um, not taking money from super PACs if you want to be able to win. So it's like Bernie is the one who introduced all of this. Why would that mean that he hasn't made an impact and he doesn't have a right to run in the primary again? Uh, So anyway... (laughs) Yeah, one one criticism. I don't remember where I was going with that, actually. What was my point? Oh, just people being like, you know, like, oh, the same thing's going to happen, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, you can't say that. You cannot imagine that 2016 America and 2020 America are the same. It's different. Trump has changed things. Trump has, you know, increased his support in his most diehard supporters, but then a lot of people who did support Trump don't support Trump anymore. And, you know, on the Democrat side, a lot of shifts have happened as well. Nathan's calling me. Please stop. I can't hear my thoughts. (laughs) Anyway, hold on. I forgot that I could decline the call. Um... So anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly excited about the primary. I'm really excited about a lot of the politicians. It's not just Bernie. I love, I love Bernie. I'm supporting him. Um, I don't think that it's possible for any other candidate to win me over, over Bernie because, again, he's just he's the OG. And when I'm literally just looking at policy, which is what Bernie is all about, he always is only talking policy. A lot of people will be like, oh, he's just an old white man. He has no character like or no personality. He just yells. It's like that's because all he wants to talk about is the policy. He wants to talk about the things that he really wants. He's not one of those charismatic politicians who has, you know, good looks and just comes out and tells you what you want to hear. He tells you what he believes and what he wants for people. And what he wants for people are things that would ultimately help 99% of Americans. The only people that should be afraid of Bernie are, you know, 
Wall Street, the 1% or the billionaires of America, you know, the pharmaceutical industry maybe. But, um, you know, the vast majority of Americans would greatly benefit from the policies that he is fighting for. Um, so anyway, a huge fan. But also, you know, there are so many great people in the running, and that's awesome to see. I'm glad to see Tulsi and Elizabeth Warren and even more, you know, centrist or establishment kind of <laughs> candidates like Kamala Harris, um, because, you know, it's good. It's good to see more people in the primary rather than none, uh, except we may have the opposite problem and end up having like 20 people in the running. And, you know, eventually people are going to have to drop out closer to the primaries or maybe after like the first two, New Hampshire, Iowa, um, to give, you know, the race a chance. Because obviously we don't want this, the votes to be split between like four or five, six people. Um, but anyway, holy shit, can you tell that I'm already in political mode? <laughs> I'm like, I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tone it down. I'm gonna chill out this election cycle. And then I'm like, wait, it's 2020. Um, it's literally a year before any of the voting happens. And um, that's pretty crazy because I know that this will be a huge part of like what's on my mind for the next year or more than a year because it'll be um, until the next president is inaugurated, which hopefully will not be Trump for a second term. So yeah, again, it, you're probably not listening to this if you don't at least somewhat align with my beliefs. I know that um, conservatives probably don't like listening to my political rants, which I apologize. You know, I, I want to be open to other people because I think a lot of our ideas kind of stem, stem from a lot of the same things. Obviously, there are issues that divide the parties usually, but... Um, Anyway, I'm excited. I'm really excited to see what the other candidates have to say in terms of the other Democrats. Um, so far, I've only donated to Bernie and I bought a shirt. I already bought a fucking Bernie shirt. I could not control myself. As soon as I saw them on the store, I was like, fuck, here you go. Take my $27. Um, but I would like to still donate a little bit to some other candidates. And once they have, you know, their town halls and we start hearing debates, it'll be really great. I just, I want to hear what the other candidates have to say. And ultimately, it's great to see more progressivism. Does that make sense? Um, more progressive Democrats coming out, because I think that that's the shift that we're going in. People are going away from, you know, the standard, like, tired democratic ideals because you know political parties are always changing so you know the party of bill clinton's presidency is very different to the you know obama era and now it's different as well and things are rapidly changing you know we've got aoc we've got alexandria ocasio cortez who is my freaking hero um i love her i love how bold she is i love that she is making so many great statements as a freshman, a very, very fresh uh, representative. And it is just, it's very encouraging. Someday I literally ugh, may consider going into politics. Um, I think that a lot of my YouTube videos and online content would probably come back to bite me in the ass, but you know, a girl can dream. Anyway, thank you guys so much for listening, especially to this last little political segment. If you are also a Bernie fan or honestly any Anyone who's going to vote for a Democrat in 2020, that's good. That'll make me happy. And hopefully, no matter who gets the nomination, we can all unite and vote for the Democrat because I think it's safe to say, let's not vote for Trump again, please, please. And if you are going to vote for Trump, you, I don't know. You can tell me why, but we, we, we will disagree. Anyway, uh, thank you guys for listening. This lighting is horrendous. I apologize for those of you watching the video, but stay tuned for another episode. Also, before the end of February, I would like to post our February bonus episode for patrons. So patrons, keep an eye out on Patreon for the bonus episode and hold me accountable because I want to be consistent about something for once. Okay, thank you for listening. Okay, thanks. Bye.